there are many passages that we could go to to talk about um, the, the fighting fear uh, that we're looking at today. Um, my topic that I was assigned was the, the fear of God. And if, if you're thinking of like, okay, wh what would be a passage that, that talks about that, uh, you would probably think of famous ones like Proverbs 1-7, uh, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, or Proverbs 9-10, the beginning of wisdom. Uh, and, and those are great passages, but I think one of the things that highlights not only what the fear of the Lord is, but how to actually go about fearing the Lord actually is Psalm 34. And you'll notice at the top of Psalm 34, it says that it's a Psalm of David when he pretended madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. And this psalm is really one that is, is really awesome because we get to uh, see kind of a glimpse into David's thought kind of like while he's, while he's uh, living in the moment here. Um, and he's actually more than likely referencing a story that takes place in 1 Samuel 21. You don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll summarize it uh, for you. But David is on the run from Saul. And if you remember that, Saul is very ticked off at David. Uh, for receiving a lot more glory than Saul received from, for what David did against Goliath. And many times after that, Saul tries to have David killed. Now, I don't know if there's been anyone lately in your life that has been trying to uh, do away with you, uh, but David is, is experiencing this, and it would certainly be something that would be frightful and fear-inducing. And so David is, uh, at, after a few times uh, of Saul trying to kill him, he's like, okay, I think I'm starting to get the picture. And he runs away. He flees to this uh, place called Nob where Ahimelech, the priest, uh, gives him food and gives him Goliath's sword for his journey. And uh, I don't know if this was the, the, the brightest moment in David's life or if it was like he thought that he was you know, really bold. Uh, and so he takes Goliath's sword, and, and he ends up going to Goliath's hometown of Gath in the Philistine country. And so whether or not David was trying to, you know, be all incognito or, or like, okay, like, these people are going to fear me because I got Goliath's sword right here. We don't really know exactly all that David was thinking here, but whatever happened, David doesn't have much confidence when he gets to Gath, uh, where the Philistines are. And so the servants of the king Achish, which, uh, if, if you notice, like, well, that's different from the name that was in the title of Psalm 34, Abimelech. Uh, but Abimelech here is, uh, more, is actually, uh, the, the term actually talks about the father of kings. So it's more of like, uh, it could pot potentially be like a title for what Achish was in Gath. So Achish is this king in Gath, and the servants point David out to, to him like, hey, this is the man who everyone was talking about, like, you know, David is, uh, or Saul has killed his thousands, but David, his tens of thousands, like, this is the guy. And so, uh, more than likely, David is, is in their hands. They, they've captured him, and David is said to be very afraid. And it's kind of like out of the frying pan into the fire for David. Like, it, it is still a very frightening situation. And so, what does David do? Uh, he... He acts strange, which is not uncommon for people who are under intense stress and un under intense uh, agony, potentially, of what's going to happen. And so David changes his behavior and pretends to be insane. He's scratching the walls, maybe, uh, maybe carving something into the, the, the doors. He's having saliva run down his beard. He's acting like he is insane and he's gone mad. And then to wh whether David thought this would work or not, it actually worked. And Achish is like, I have enough madmen around here. I don't need one more to, you know, just, you know, uh, just have around the, the, the castle or whatever the place is where the king is. He's saying, we just need to get rid of David, send him on his way. And that's what happens. David is sent, uh, he, he departs from there and he escapes, for Samuel 22 says, to a cave. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him and everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him, likely those who didn't really care for Saul a whole lot. And so David became captain over them. So this is the context 
David has just escaped this. So what is David's takeaway from this? Is he going to say, you know what? You know how to handle your fears is you just need to, you know, to think on your feet. Be, be like, you know, very wise and, and have a lot of mental acuity to get over your fears, um, just like I did. That's actually not what David says. Look at Psalm 34 with me, and, and we'll see. This is David's response. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him, and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned." This is the response that David has after this situation. He's not saying like, hey, guys, you got to hear this story. This is pretty awesome. Like, I, I just acted mad in front of these people, and I just, you know, I, I got away. No, he's saying, I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. David was legitimately afraid in the moment when he is uh, underneath the thumb of Achish. He is legitimately afraid in, in running for his life from Saul. But it wasn't because he had the right attitude that he drowns his takeaways. Actually, it's the fear of God that actually shows up prominently here. You know, fear itself doesn't make sense to us a lot of times. In one sense, we, we don't like to be frightened. We don't like it when, uh, when your, your, your spouse hides behind a door and stares, stares you half to death. No, Lydia hasn't done that to me. It's been more of the other way around, and she doesn't like it. Uh, I'm learning. But there's also something where, in some ways, we do like to be frightened. We like to go to a, a haunted porn maze, some of us, or, or ride a, a scary roller coaster. Those are nice when they're in our control. But what happens when you don't have any control? And David is saying that's actually the point where you realize the only thing you have is God in those moments. So it's no surprise that the scriptures are filled with hundreds of, of, of times saying, don't be afraid, do not fear. But yet at the same time, there is a fear that you and I must have. It is the fear of God. Now, there may be some who equate the fear of God with uh, maybe the, the Puritans of a bygone age, uh, or maybe these super Christians, or maybe these, these uh, Christians who are very stingy and wooden, those Christians that just don't like to have a lot of fun. But actually, Psalm 34 provides the right antidote, the right, the, the, the right level of, of stability when it comes to what the fear of the Lord actually is. And it's not just for theologians and pastors. It's for everyone who 
is a believer, to fear the Lord rightly. Now, David uh, makes this psalm so generic, and, and, and I think it's very helpful that you can not just apply this to his situation, but to any time that you and I fear anything, we can apply Psalm 34 to our fears by fearing the Lord. So David answers this question, why or how should we fear the Lord in response to all our fears? And he begins this psalm by focusing on fearing the Lord because he is great. Fearing the Lord because he is great. Now we get this, I'm sure, especially last Monday, if, uh, if you traveled outside of, of the area uh, to go look at the solar eclipse, maybe some of you were like, I, I, I don't just want to see it through my, uh, my cool glasses that I just bought recently, but I want to see it through a telescope. I want to see what, what is going on up close. And that's the wonderful thing about telescopes is that they bring small objects and they magnify them uh, so we get a better sense of just the size and grandeur. Now, the sun and stars are gigantic compared to us, and yet they were also created by an all-powerful creator God who is way bigger than all of these combined. God spoke them all into existence, and he also spoke you into existence. So the reason for uh, many of our fears is that we don't understand just how great our God is, how holy he is. The definition of fearing the Lord actually in, in much of God's word references to, his, to the awe of God, to reverencing him as majestic. He is holy and totally other. We see from scripture that God is greater than any fear uh, than be, that we could conjure up. All of the fears that, that, we, that are either real or, or that we're, we're kind of like, well, this, this might happen. This might uh, take place over here. But all of these fears, they pale in comparison to understanding that God is greater than even those. So how do we understand how great God is? Well, first off, look at verse 1. David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. And David says that God's praise will continually be in his mouth. And this isn't necessarily saying that David is, is going to be like, okay, like I've, I've thought of you know, this psalm and this psalm, and so I, I just got to keep on saying these, 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 uh, these truths over and over again, and you know, there's nothing else that, that occupies my day. Uh, I don't think that's, that's necessarily the, the reality of what David is, is talking about here. And I think Charles Spurgeon uh, actually helps clarify this a bit. He says, in every situation, under every circumstance, before, in, and after trials, in bright days of glee and dark nights of fear, to bless the Lord is never unseasonable. And so throughout any time of life, whether there are good times or whether there are bad times, whether there, there are times of ease or, or times of, man, life is just hectic right now. I can bless the Lord at all times. So here's the question. How often do you meditate even on God's greatness? Is it just when, when you come to church on Sundays? Or is it throughout, your, throughout the week? Is it through, through the good times or also through the bad times? Oftentimes, the reason why our fears seem so big is because we've actually been meditating on those things for a long time. You and I are actually really good meditators. It's just of what we choose to meditate on. And so David cannot hold back what is happening in his heart as God becomes more majestic. He's more beautiful. He's more capable of running, uh, of running David's life than he is. And so David is like, I'm going to meditate on who God is. And it's not just about meditating on, on, on him like, okay, I just got to, you know, think about God and that's it. Uh, there's actually a glad response. In verse 2, David says, My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. The fear of the Lord is actually not a, a, a grim proposition. It's not something that, that is like, man, I just got to fear the Lord and got to do this Christian life and get along. That's not what the fear of the Lord is. That's a, that's a, a gross misunderstanding of what fearing him uh, in, entails. 
This is the, the, the real difference between the fear of God and the fear of anything else. When you fear God rightly, you rejoice that God's in control. He's bigger than all of our fears. And so when the afflicted, when the humble hear of God and who he is, it stirs rejoicing and gladness and selfless praise for the greatness of God. One of the reasons we rejoice is because when we understand that God is great, all of these other fears slip away. When, when you're thinking about, man, God is actually greater than, than anything uh, else in my life that, that's going on, these other fears, I, I find that I just stop thinking about them as much. They, they actually don't seem to have as much of a hold on me as they once did. This is, uh, in, in, in some ways, what happens... Uh, you might remember when, uh, when Pastor Ben talked about a long time ago uh, with Jesus and his disciples on the Sea of Galilee. When the storm comes and, and the, the, the waves are high, the disciples who are trained fishermen uh, and, and handy with a boat are, are, are frightened out of their socks in the boat because of this storm. And Jesus, they, they, they go to him and say, hey, Wake up, you gotta, you gotta help us out here. And Jesus calms the storm, but the disciples don't stop trembling. And it's not because they're, they're still thinking back like, wow, that was an incredible storm. They sit trembling at the greatness of Jesus. There is no one else like him. And so, but it does lead to further adoration of Jesus as well. And so, Moving to verse 4, we, we don't just see the fear that, that we should fear the Lord because he is great, but we should fear the Lord also because he is good. Look at verses 4, four through 10. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. This great God who, who, is, who is in the heavens, he actually takes care over you. He, he wants to hear what you have to say. Verse 5, they looked to him and were radiant. Their faces weren't ashamed. This poor man cried out, the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that he is good. David's testimony is that God's goodness uh, is not to be uh, let, let, left on the sideline. He provides rescue from our fears. So we fear God's goodness because in his goodness, we find deliverance. The, one of the perfect so solutions to any fear that we may encounter is remembering what God has done in the past to save us. And this is what David is doing. He, he's saying, this is my testimony of what God has done. For you and for me, what has God done in your life? If you're a believer, you, you automatically know there is, there is one thing that is definitely clear that God has saved you from your sins, that you, you couldn't uh, uh, do anything to get rid of yourself. So if you're a believer here this morning, you, you recognize that without Jesus, we all stand uh, condemned. God is, is, is just in judging us, in, in giving us dishonor and condemnation. So if you look kind of as the antithesis of verses 4 through 7, Kind of read verse, verses 4 to 7 if, if God weren't good. What would that look like? Without Christ, you would fear and cry out to the Lord, but he wouldn't hear you. Without Christ, you would look to God and instead of radiance, you would see misery. Without Christ, you would look to God and instead of radiance, you... Uh, sorry, I read that again. Without Christ, your life would be filled with countless troubles and not least of which would be your own dread of death on account of your sins. I, I, I like this antithesis in, in verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him. If God were not good, the angel of the Lord wouldn't encamp around you, but would rather be against you. What a scary proposition. Of all the fears that you would have to fear, you don't want to go against God and the angel of the Lord. But this is not the final word, is not That God is good. I, I like what Charles Spurgeon says again. God's goodness often fills us with amazement and, and astonished at, at, at the Lord's gracious dealings with us. And we say to him, why hast thou been so good to me for so many years and in such multitudes of forms? Why hast thou manifested so much mercy and tenderness toward me? 
Thou hast treated me as if I had never grieved or offended thee. Isn't that amazing that God, when he sees you, he sees someone who has never offended him or, or, or said an ill word towards him because of Christ. What an amazing thought that God's goodness is, is, is there and he gives us deliverance. And so we rightly rejoice and tremble. There is no God like this God. Verse, verses eight, eight through 10 uh, continue that we should fear God because he provides himself as our provision. And even Peter will use verse eight in his first epistle uh, in, in, his, uh, in chapter two of first Peter. He says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is, and Psalm 34, eight says, that the Lord is good, but Peter, he, he shows the intent of what, uh, of what that verse is saying, really. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. John Bunyan writes more of God's goodness as, as God's grace. He says, there is nothing in heaven or earth that can so awe the heart as the grace of God. Tis that which makes a man fear, tis that which makes a man tremble, Tis that which makes a man bow and bend and break to pieces. Nothing has that majesty but the grace of God. And so, to be clear also, we, we, we don't fear God because of the things that, that he gives to us uh, primarily. Obviously, those are wonderful things. God gives us many things that are good, like forgiveness, mercy, grace, all of these things. And yet we also want to, to make sure that we are not enjoying the gift while despising the giver. And so David's point here is, is not like, hey, you know, fear in, in this way and, and taste and see uh, this goodness. But taste and see that the Lord is good. We fear God because he is enough. And Psalm 46 continues saying, God God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. And so David even says in this other psalm that there is no want to those who fear God. There is, uh, for, for those who fear God, will not lack any good thing. So here, here's, some, here's a good litmus test for do you fear God Truly, do you fear God rightly? What would happen, or what happens, I should say, because this does happen when things don't go your way? Now, we, we asked our, uh, our ECS elementary students, so this thing didn't go your way. So how are you going to respond? Because life, stuff will not go your way. What will happen when the most precious thing that you own is taken away from you? What are you, what's, your, what's your response going to be? What's, what will happen if potentially your whole world collapses? What are you going to do? Is God still going to be enough for you? Well, David's response is yes. God will sustain me. He will preserve my soul. In, in, a, in another Psalm, Psalm 84, he says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Do you worry about what's in your bank account, especially after all the tax talk this morning? Do you worry about your future? Do you worry about your children's future? I'm, I'm sure we've, many of us have, if we've paid any attention to what's going on in, in the news cycle, there's a lot of things that can really uh, afflict our, our souls, thinking what is going to happen in the next couple of months? in the next four years and beyond. Well, growing in the fear of the Lord means that we are growing more in our acquaintance with God's greatness and God's goodness. He will sustain us. Even in, in the last part of verse 10, the young lions lack and suffer hunger. The, the, the young lions that, that should be the strongest, should, should, should be uh, the, the ones who, who have the most energy. They may go, go without food, but those who seek the Lord God will sustain us. He will provide for us. And so David's going to continue showing 
what the fear of the Lord does in, in our lives and the reasons for fearing the Lord. We fear the Lord because God is great. We fear the Lord because he is good. And in verses 11 through 14, we fear the Lord, how? By following his ways. Verse 11 says, Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? This is obviously not just a psalm for those who are, are uh, children and young people in this room, although this, uh, this psalm is, is definitely one that, that our children and our teens and our young adults should take to heart. But this is for both, both the young and the old that we need to understand what the fear of the Lord is. This is the fear of the Lord applied. Fearing God from verses 11 through 12 is, is something that involves changing what you live for. Fearing the Lord involves changing what you live for. Michael Reeves, uh, in talking about the fear of God, says, it is the heartbeat of our new life in Christ. Every decision that you make is based on what you value. And what you value is, in some ways, in many ways, based on what you fear. When we fear the Lord, there's a new desire to want the things that God wants. And this involves a change in what we live for. And there's even hints of, of Ecclesiastes in Psalm 34. If, if you've uh, never read Ecclesiastes, I would encourage you. It's, it's just 12 chapters uh, in, in uh, just two uh, books after Psalms. Uh, but this, this book written by Solomon is basically, in a nutshell, talking about the only thing that, that we as, as believers that's required of us is, at the end of the book, fear God and keep his commandments. So you, there's, there's so many other things in life, and yes, that, that, that God has given us to enjoy, but ultimately, if you are living for those things, you will come up short. If you are living for the one who has given you those things, you will actually live a, a life that has been fulfilling. It has been purpose-filled because you have had this awesome relationship with the creator, God. So back in Psalm 34, David will, will, will give these two general practical points to this person who's, who's saying, yes, I, I want to live many good days. I, this is the kind of life, the, 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 uh, the fulfilling life that I want to have in fearing the Lord. And David's going to say, okay, these are, these are the characteristics. These are the, the, the ways that you can identify whether or not you are actually fearing the Lord. Verse 13, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So for David, he said, this is how you can know that you're fearing the Lord because you stay away from what is evil. You avoid it. You, you, uh, you're not afraid to call sin what it is. You don't mess around on the fringes trying to get as close to sin without actually sinning. How you respond when other people may, may say nasty things against you when, when, uh, things, when people may try to do evil things against you, how are you going to respond? Are you going to respond in kind? Or is the, the fear of God the ruling factor in how you respond? David actually takes this advice later in 1 Samuel. How does he do that? Well, if, if you remember, like Saul hasn't been like, Saul isn't willing to say like, okay, yeah, just like Achish, we're gonna let David go and just do what he wants. That's not the case. Saul is still pursuing David. And, and even uh, to, to the point where there's one time in, in 1 Samuel 24 where, where, he's, he, where Saul, the king, hears of the Philistines trying to invade the land and he's like, okay, we, we got to go take care of this and not keep on running after David. And so once they take care of that, that small invasion, Saul takes 3,000 men to go pursue David. And he's in these caves. Now, not only does Saul want to kill him, and, and David knows that very well, but there are 3,000 people that Saul has sent after David. This is not looking good. And, and if you were in David's position, and if I was in David's position, I would think like, man, I just need to get rid of this Saul guy. He's just irritating. Like, can you just leave me alone? And so 
Saul pursues David amongst these, these, uh, these caves, and David and, and, and his men, they're, they're hiding in this one cave, and Saul is just passing along, basically, and he decides, okay, I'm just going to go into this cave really quick, go to the men's room, and, and you know, we'll get back, and we'll keep on looking for David. But in this same cave, David and his men are hiding, and Saul chooses uh, to, to go into this cave. David has his back up against the wall, and he has a choice. There's an opportunity here to take out Saul. But if you know your Bible, does David actually do that? No. As much as his men are saying, now is your opportunity. If you want to, to just like get, get Saul off of your back, kill him, get rid of him. But instead, David chooses to cut a piece off of Saul's robe and show Saul, listen, I could have killed you, but I'm not against you. And this happens, unfortunately, a few more times, but David still is not willing to speak evil of Saul or to seek evil against Saul. And we see that even in, in this passage, this is because David fears the Lord. He understands that, that God has put Saul in this position of authority, and David will will honor the Lord before taking matters into his own hands. This is incredible because this is maybe not how most of us would have reacted in that situation, I, want, I, I, I feel like. But when we're encountered with earthly fears, many times we'll use different tactics at our disposal to cling closely to what we value, to, to, to what is most important to us. But following God's ways will actually, um, will actually say, okay, these things that I hold dearly, like God is in control of those and he can do what, what he wills with those. And, and by following God's way, it will confirm what Jesus and even the, the apostle Peter say, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. Isn't that an amazing promise from God? And speaking of promises, that's what David gets into with even these last verses of Psalm 34. We fear the Lord because he takes care of the righteous. We fear the Lord because he takes care of the righteous. In verse 15, David reminds us that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them from out of their trouble. So God favors the righteous. This reminds us of what Paul says in Romans 8, if God be for us, who can be against us? God sees everything from our past, our present, and our future. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And what's more is that God knows what we need when we need it. God knows what is good for us. The Lord is attentive to the cries of his people and delivers them from their troubles or you could even say their, their, their anguishes, their anxieties. He is a good father. He gives what is best for his children. And this helps us in fearful situations because I can give total control over to the one who ultimately has the final word, to the one who has the ultimate word over me. Because God's promises are true, that whatever I'm facing will one day end through his strength, we don't have to fear any troubles. What's more, in verses 16 and 21, David's going to say, there's, there's something about the wicked that you should also know, that God rejects the wicked. You know what, Saul? He's one day going to come to an end. And if he doesn't turn to me, I'm going to deal with him. And God does deal with him eventually. David recognized that Saul was going to be dealt with in God's time. There will come a day when evil will not only be punished, but those who do evil, who hate God's people and God's ways, will be remembered no more. This is a comforting thing, especially when you see so many injustices around the world, and, and our culture is, is actually uh, pr pretty uh, staunchly for figuring out all of the injustices that, that go on in, in our culture, many of which can be helpful, like, there's a lot of bad things that happen in the world. And some of those things don't get dealt with how we see fit all the time. Most of the time, we're like, oh, 
I don't like how, how that case turned out. Or I don't like that that person seemed to get away scotch-free. But we realize, ultimately, the wicked will be punished by God. Now, this doesn't give us license like the Pharisees to say, you know, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like those people, like those wicked people who aren't going to be remembered anymore. Uh, it's, it's not saying that, but we actually rejoice and tremble that, you know what, God has been so good to each and every one of us. We actually should have been counted as those wicked ones, but God has given us his son, Jesus Christ, to give us salvation, to give us grace and mercy. And it's with this sort of spirit of, of healthy and godly fear that God ensures what, what is, is seen in verse 18, his presence with us through difficulty. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. So God ensures his presence through difficulty. The, the imagery in verse 18 describes many of, the, of, how, of our own realities, our own troubles, our own fears. It could, uh, the, the brokenhearted here could even be translated in, in terms of, of shattered glass. Have, have you ever felt like your world has been shattered, that maybe your heart has been, has been broken into so many pieces and you thought, is, is, is there anyone that understands? Is there anyone that I can turn to? And David says right here, the Lord is near to those, to, to, to those types of people, to those who are shattered in heart. When we're faced with our own grim realities of, of our sinfulness even, we can be brought low and think that there's no hope for me. I've done too many wicked things. I've, uh, I've, I've thought too many uh, terrible thoughts that if anyone knew, they, they would say, there's no chance, no chance in the world that that person deserves God's favor. But the Lord comes near to these types of people. We're met with the wonderful news that even though God is great, he is, he is holy and just, he is also merciful and gracious. And this is the grandeur and wonder that the one who is high and lifted up, as Isaiah 57 says, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, who dwells in the high and holy place, also stoops to dwell with those of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And so it's not a contradiction to see that for those who fear the Lord, they will be delivered and yet still suffer affliction. It's, a, it, it's actually kind of a, a, a remarkable thing that David acknowledges this. Just because we fear the Lord and he will deliver us doesn't mean that there won't be hardships in this life. Well, how does this make sense? Well, I think you might find a bit of the answer, especially as New Testament believers, when you look at verse 20. Verse 20 that says, He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. What is, what is that talking about? We, as New Testament, New Testament believers, we recognize that's actually referenced when Jesus, the Son of God, is hanging on a cross, and even though uh, he, he has died this horrible death, the Roman guards do not break any of, of his bones as they do to many other uh, people who, who have hung on a cross. But actually, Jesus didn't stay dead. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus, the only Son of God, was bruised and scourged, hung on, on a cross, took on, our full, on the full wrath of God that you and I deserve. But the amazing thing with the crucifixion and even what Psalm 34 We'll, we'll discuss is that it reminds us that ultimately the righteous person who suffers will ultimately be vindicated by the Father. Jesus was vindicated in the resurrection even through the, this suffering. And this also applies to you. If you are, are a believer in God, if you are a, a follower of Christ, if you fear God like this passage describes, then even though you suffer affliction, even though you suffer uh, trials and, and, and temptations and tribulations, those don't have the final say in your life. And so it is with this that, that even Paul says later in Romans 8, he who did not spare his own son, 
but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And so we come to this, this last summary statement in verse 22, that God vindicates those who trust him. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. It's amazing how many times the fear of God and the trust of God, they're actually used very much uh, interchangeably throughout the Psalms, throughout all of the scriptures. Fear and trust in God. God will never leave you or forsake you. He will never desert his own. Thus, we can trust him. We fight fear with the fear and trust of the Lord. So let him be your shield. Let him be your strength. I like what one of the songs we, we just sang already. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. This is the God whom we fear. So in fearing the Lord, in conclusion, it involves understanding God's greatness and his goodness that are specifically found in Christ. And it plays out into our daily life and our daily living so that we trust his providential care over our lives. So if you're here today and you thought, man, I've before just thought of the fear of God as like, God is a tyrant. God is this, this wicked overseer who is not really interested in me. Uh, you're wrong. The fear of the Lord actually brings us to an understanding of his goodness, his graciousness to those who turn and cry out to him in repentance and faith. And so if you're here this morning and you've never cried out to the Lord, asking him to save you from your sins, to enter into a relationship with him. This morning, as Romans 10, 13 says, that those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you do that this morning, you will be saved. God will deliver you. And I, I grant we haven't addressed all the fears that, that we could you know, ever have this morning. If, if we listed out all of the many fears that, that could be, Uh, take place, we would be here for a while. But realizing that the fear of the Lord actually helps with any fear that we encounter, we grow in this fear, we grow in this grace that God has given for us so that we can freely and joyfully live before him. We're we're going to end our service by singing Amazing Grace. And one of the uh, one of the cool things that I think is in this song is obviously John Newton uh, was, uh, was a slave uh, trader. He was a, a, a slave ship captain. Uh, and he, in one of the one of, uh, many violent storms that, that he was in, finally, after rebelling against God, calls out to Jesus and asks to be saved. He, he calls on the Lord's mercy. And he is drastically changed after that. 25 years after this moment, he writes Amazing Grace. And the second stanza, I think, just encapsulates a lot of what is going on when we talk about fearing the Lord. It says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed.'" So has the grace of God taught you how to fear the Lord in a right way? May, may we all, both small and great, be a church that is marked by the fear of the Lord. Let's close with a word of prayer before we sing this last song together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy and grace to us. We thank you that we can taste and see that you are good not only in looking at David's situation, not only looking at at our own situations, but recognizing that Jesus, even when when he was under intense pressure, he he cried out, and he is the only one who who took uh, our our shame, our, our our guilt, so that we might be made righteous. You have. Uh, given Jesus so that we can not experience shame and disfavor so that we would, uh, would be lost in our sins. We thank you for the righteousness of Christ. We, we pray that 
what we've heard this morning would, would be something that we can apply to any of our fears, whether they are small or great, that we would recognize your greatness and your goodness to us. We pray that in our lives we would pursue peace with everyone, recognizing who holds us fast. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.